speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester. Rochester Indian Media. This is Dawn with Rochester Indie Media, and today's show is going to be very exciting. We're going to be talking about immigrant rights with some local organizers and activists and a former farm worker here in the area. But before we get to all the important topics of the day, I just want to make comments about I told Roberto before the show I would tell you why I'm the barefoot host for the Indie Media TV show. And it was a fluke last week on our first show. I didn't like the shoes I brought, so I didn't want to wear them. And I went barefoot, and I thought it was like symbolic of freedom and just being who you are, you know, being a little real on public access television, which is great. And um, the guest who was here last week was an Iraq veteran against the war, and he had post-traumatic stress syndrome, and he was very nervous. And he said, after the show, he said, this is the first time I did a show where my heart wasn't pounding and I wasn't anxious and sweating. He said, I think it helped that you were barefoot. So I thought if it could also help mitigate symptoms of post-traumatic stress, that we should constantly go barefoot, you know, because there's a lot of that in our society. But... Uh, Without further ado, Roberto Resto is here with us today and Librada Paz, and I'm trying to roll my R's in the Spanish way the best I can after my two years of Spanish. Roberto Resto works with Rochester Alliance for Immigrant Rights, and Librada Paz is a former farm worker and currently executive director is your title at the Rural Ministry Outreach. And we're going to be talking today just about... Um, the issues of the day right now, what's going on. And so first I'm going to let Roberto and Librada introduce yourselves and your background. So we'll start there, Roberto. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Roberto Resto. I'm a Vietnam veteran and uh, I'm a sociology degree from the Inter-American uh, University of Puerto Rico. Uh, my father was a farm worker in, in the farms of Rochester in the, in the 50s. So. Mm -hmm. And Librada. Yes, um, my name is Librada Paz. And I, I was, um, well, it's so hard for me to say because um, I was an immigrant and I was a migrant and I was an undocumented. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say immigrant. I'm still an immigrant. <laughs> so, uh, but it's true what you say. I work in the farm for almost 15 years migrating um, the many kinds of crops and of course I get a chance to go to school and that's how I graduate at RIT. Mm -hmm. And um, a little bit about your story about coming into the United States and it's interesting too when you said you're still an immigrant is that a how do you feel about that label and that title and what does that kind of mean for you that, uh, that I mean um, uh, even though I've been living here for a very long time but I, I feel like I'm just a recent arriving person here in this country too, because I mean, um, it's, it is so hard to abandon your country and come and be part of the, another country, you know? So that's how I felt like, I mean, I'm just a recent immigrant, uh, a migrant who did a lot of things uh, to achieve what I really wanted to. So um, that's how I felt. Mm -hmm. And um, Roberto, you were telling me earlier before the show started that your family from Puerto Rico worked on the farms, you know, in the 50s. Your father was a farm worker and that you didn't see much change from then until now. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, my father was a migrant worker. Although uh, Puerto Ricans are uh, United States citizens ever since 1917, uh, uh, they uh, were the the immigration department in those years did was uh, go to Puerto Rico and uh, and uh, draft uh, people to come work in, in the farms uh, of, of New York and, and California and all over the place. 
So they would pay your way into the United States so you can work. But uh, once you got here, you had no rights. You have to live in the farms in slave conditions and uh, very little pay and more than 16 hours uh, work days. And uh, uh, that's uh, one of the main engines behind me being an organizer for immigrants' rights today because uh, I know what my father went through. I know how much he suffered. Mm -hmm. And Librada, your experience, did you live in um, a migrant farm worker camps when you first came with your family? Or uh, your yes, uh, it was very tough for me, but before I go through my own experience, I want to bring back what Roberto said, because also my father was a uh, um, a guest worker, which they called the Bracero, a long time ago. He uh, came in here a very, very long time ago, maybe when I was a baby or so. Just uh, him, he came by himself to work and then to bring yes, yes. resources and get his family back? Uh, uh, and then he went back in, yes. And then years later on, then I decided to come in this country. Uh, but definitely it is because we always are looking for a better future and I was looking for a dream. Uh, so um, a dream that I really wanted to, that I cannot uh, build, that I can achieve in Mexico. So um, I came in here and I migrated uh, state to state, East Coast, I mean, from New York all the way to Florida and then come back again and things like that. Um, was there a period where you were separated from your family for any length of time? Or I'm sorry? Were you separated from your family? Yes, and yes. I mean, I left my parents. I left, um, I mean, there was only two or three of us from the family who left and come to this country. And it was very hard, very, very hard because uh, I was only 15 when I came in. Um, I, I did not know where I was going to end up. You know, I did not know the condition. I did not know uh, what farm worker uh, in the United States um, living conditions are. And what is it? Just give people an idea. So many yes. people don't know. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, it's it is, it is true. I mean, um, it is really hard to be a farm worker because um, a lot of the places where we migrating, um, we don't live like um, good living condition houses. Um, I can just say that like right in these scenes, like the space in here, uh, we would just squeeze in like five to six people um, in, in a small room. And it, it's very tough. I mean, I remember uh, just a little bigger than that, there were 11 of us in that room, uh, four women and six men all together. And, and also, I mean, end up here in New York, the same condition. No split room for women or for men, mm -hmm. or share. That was very tough for me because I was very young and. And then the actual labor has got to be so physically um, taxing on your body and with chemicals and sprays yes. and being out in the the field and then not having health insurance. Um, Especially pesticides. Pesticides affect me a lot, mm -hmm. a lot because uh, you get wet all morning, every morning with the chemicals inside and it goes through your body. And then that's how a lot of people get fungus too, or fungus, um, and, and that's that's really bad. Mm -hmm. And then also the sunshine hits your eyes so bad, and then also that causes you, um, oh God, I forgot what's that, affect in your eyes, and, and that you become blinded later on too. So mm -hmm. all of those, it's a very hard condition for the farm workers because we work um, from 7 a.m. all the way to 7 p.m. Sometimes people work until 9 p.m. And then in the morning we had to get up and then go to work again. So it's really hard, very, very hard. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, I want to talk to both of you about the organizations you work with and what you're seeing now. So let's take our break and come back and talk yeah. more. Thanks. <laughs> against the war, we also stand behind those who resist it. More and more U.S. service members are actively refusing to participate in the illegal, immoral invasion and occupation of Iraq. No more. We have a different path to take, and it doesn't matter what they do to us. It doesn't matter if they, if they take away our, um, our honorable discharge, if they put us in prison. Call it peace or call it treason, call it love or call it reason, but I ain't marching anymore. Iraq Vets Against the War is a group of veterans that have served since 9-11 uh, in the war on terror. 
and uh, we stand for three things. Uh, immediate withdrawal of all U.S. occupying forces from Iraq, uh, reparations for the Iraqi people, and uh, full benefits for all veterans. And the reason I have the flag upside down on my shoulder is because it's a symbol of distress. Because I am very distressed. My friends are being stop lost and sent back to Iraq without their consent. Uh, the myth of the volunteer army is very distressing to me because it's not a volunteer army. Uh, we've been enslaving soldiers for six years now under the pretext of a national emergency, which is back with Rochester Indie TV in our studio suite here at Rochester Community Television. We love public access. I got to get a plug out for public access. Mm -hmm. This is a people's media channel. We got to keep it alive and well and uh, bring shows to the air that you don't normally see, you know, um, just grassroots and people, local organizers getting together and talking and meeting. So this is great to have you guys come today. Thank you very much. And um, to go back now to Roberto, the work you're doing with Rochester Alliance for Immigrant Rights. Uh, during the break, we were talking about the language, and I was saying I feel uncomfortable even referring to people as immigrant and undocumented. It's awkward to use that because I don't believe in borders personally, and I don't think we need them, and I think we're all part of the human race, and people need to live free, and people will go and live mostly in the cultures they're from and want to go back. And from what I understand, even some of the things happening along the border right now, putting up the fences and making it so hard for people to get home, more people are staying than traveling freely, seeing family, going home and, you know, moving freely as people should. So I find that, um, you know, labels very derogatory and negative. And then you were talking about the illegal alien, and I like the way you stated that, how um, how derogatory that is, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, well, if, you know, that's uh, criminalization of the immigrant begins with the language that is used. So uh, uh, Washington launched the illegal aliens. They, when they talk about, like, in the books about uh, undocumented immigrants, they talk about illegal aliens. If you, if you notice that being illegal means you're a criminal. You are a hardcore criminal. And being an alien means that you don't belong to the human race. Therefore, if you don't belong to the human race, you could be criminalized. And that's a that's very dangerous kind of language that is being used uh, for these working, hard, very hardworking people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what do you see? You know, you work with Rochester Alliance for Immigrant Rights. What exactly is the organization doing? What are some of the things that you're working for, campaigns that you're working on now? and what kind of um, situations you see occurring day to day with folks? Well, the uh, Rochester Immigrants' Right came about in, uh, in April. Uh, the first match we called was in April of 2006 when the, the three million uh, immigrants, uh, immigrant families and the allies uh, came on the street against the St. Bernard Bill. Uh, we called for a march and um, we marched from the federal building to downtown North Clinton Avenue, St. Michael's Church, and 600 people came out for that. So on May 1st, we called for another march. And uh, also uh, in between April and May 1st, there was three million uh, immigrants that came out. And uh, we, were, uh, we, we were part of the, that mobilization. 600 people came out again. And uh, we decided to launch the Rochester for Immigrants' Rights mm -hmm. to defend immigrants. Mm -hmm. And then in, in August of that year, uh, we traveled to Chicago to a, a conference in which we created the National Alliance for Immigrants' Rights. Mm. And uh, we are allied through a network. So uh, anything happens in, in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in New York, in the big cities, or in uh, all the smaller cities, we know in Rochester in a matter of two hours. So we know what action to, uh, to take. So if you're saying when something happens, are you talking specifically about um, roundups and deportations? And then how do you respond? What are some of the things? Yeah, mainly, uh, mainly the, the raid, uh, raids and, and deportations. So uh, around the country, uh, different organizations create an emergency response network. So when we have one here in Rochester, it's a, uh, uh, we, haven't, uh, we haven't put it into, into work because there haven't been uh, many raids here in the city of Rochester. So there's been many raids in, in, the, in, in, in Wayne County and, and Southern. But we do have a, a emergency response network. Emergency response network is people we can call and, and activate in within 24 hours to uh, come out and, and make a, 
uh, protests. Mm -hmm. And Librada, with the uh, Rural Migrant Ministry, what are some of the things that uh, you work on and um, what have you been seeing lately in this election time? It does seem like there's a little bit more of a anti-immigration hysteria coming out. I mean, even on the liberal so-called Air America channels, I can't believe some of the stuff I hear about uh, you know, anti-immigration and securing borders and, and all the fear and racism. I guess I would call it like a racist mentality. Um, but what can you say about the work you're doing and what you're experiencing? Uh, <clears throat> yes, um, it's very tough. I remember what you say is that what's the difference between um, seeing uh, the time that I came in with the time that I, it's now, which is 20 years ago almost. Um, I, I see that instead of getting better, it's getting worse. <laughs> because, um, I mean, the immigration, about two years ago, they start to swiping out around, and it's not affecting just us as a migrant worker. And also, it's affecting the agriculture of the United States, especially here, we're talking about New York only. I mean, New York, a lot of the farmers do not have workers to pick up the apple, and then citizens complaining about work but they're not willing to go pick up those fruits. They're not willing to go and get in the mud. They're not willing to go and be in the snow, trimming the tree and all those things. So they gotta really realize that we're doing the hard work. We are doing the hard work and they don't appreciate what we do. Mm -hmm. And that's what really affects me a lot because um, we are here to empower uh, the people uh, to get connected, the farm workers with the community so they can understand why those people are here. They not come here just to get the benefits or whatever the people mm -hmm. been saying, but definitely to do the hard work that the um, citizens do not really want to do. Mm -hmm. And so we should appreciate that a lot. Mm -hmm. That debunks two of the biggest myths that I always hear, which is people are coming just to get on welfare, which we know isn't true. This is one of the hardest working group of people that want to work, you know, two or three jobs to, you know, have opportunities for their family and get an education and have resources. So it's just that's why they've left their home countries in the first place. So we know that's not true. And this, the other myth being that um, um, they're taking all the jobs. They're taking all the jobs. I mean, um, sadly, because the jobs are are so low pay people don't want these jobs you That's know but right. we do have to address that I mean what about the economic we do want to increase the wages for yes, I mean, I, farm I, workers and how do you address those like I say uh, I mean I, I heard a lot of comments from a lot of places that a lot of people do not know what farm workers go through because they do pay taxes they do pay Medicaid do they pay social security numbers they do pay everything they do pay everything so in a long period of time that a lot of people being established here for more than 10 years and why they not be able to get legal uh, status, you know? And that's the hardest thing that it breaks my heart because um, I know people who have been living here and then they've been splitting with the family and stuff like that. Uh, I think the other thing is that, like I said, people need to know that agriculture needs help uh, in, in people. The migrant workers are the ones who's doing it. So mm -hmm. without them, who's gonna do it? Are they really willing to send the kids to go and pick that up? Mm -hmm. Or they want better future for the kids? Because that's what we do. We're only doing here a favor to pick up the agriculture mm -hmm. and, and really raise the food for the people. So mm -hmm. I think that's what they really need to realize. All right, we need to go to a break. We'll be back and we'll continue this conversation. Unimpeachable, that's what you are. Like the lost sense of democracy And the thought of all those atrocities Never before Has someone been Congress has 
is now It's incredible That someone so Unimpeachable Thinks that we are So forgettable To Hi, I'm an immigrant, migrant, indie media TV host here today and barefoot. And the reason I say that is we were talking during the break about how, uh, you know, migration has happened and immigration has been the, the whole backbone of this country. So I don't feel any different. I don't feel uh, some special privilege because, you know, some part of my heritage was here longer. And I like what you were saying about that, Roberto. Would you elaborate on that, the immigration of today and the future and the past? Yeah, in 1880, for example, many of the immigrants uh, in this country were European immigrants. And uh, they won and fought, uh, they fought and won for the eight hour day in the streets of Chicago. Uh, and, and today, the workers of today uh, have eight, eight hour day because of that big fight that immigrant workers uh, put up, you know. And um, there's no difference in between the immigrants of those days and, and the immigrants of today, except the, they were European immigrants, but they, were, uh, they made big contributions to the, to the United States. And the immigrants of today are also making big contributions to this country. They say, for example, uh, Librada, she's a, a technical engineer. So mo most immigrants come to this country, uh, they learn English very fast, and, and, and they can uh, become uh, different, uh, uh, they, they, uh, different professions, like technical engineer, you know, and they contribute to the country uh, greatly rather than, than take away from the country. Immigrants are not taking away anything from this country. And most immigrants are very young. They, they come here from the ages uh, 15 to 30 in the most productive ages of the human being. So mm -hmm. they produce uh, a whole lot for the, for the country. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you were talking earlier about the, um, well, another name during 2006 uh, May Day. It was a day without immigrants, and everybody, you know, um, immigrants and migrant workers and people who were supporting just stopped, you know, working and didn't go to school that day. And in the big cities, especially New York and Chicago and LA, it was almost a complete shutdown. It was shocking the amount of just day-to-day -day functioning that this society depends on and needs from this, you know, um, banished class of people that is almost under an indentured servitude type of relationship in the United States. Can either one of you elaborate on that and what you saw at that time when workers striked and that indentured servitude relationship, if you even agree with that term? I don't know. Well, yeah, actually what, what happened, uh, I believe it was in, in May 1st, uh, the country, uh, the, the economy of the country almost paralyzed because immigrants decided not to go to work, not to shop, not to pump gas, not to do anything. And, uh, and yet again, the, the criminalization of immigrants continued. They, and then they launched the, the Washington, the Bush administration, launched the race and deportation. And ever since May 1st, 2006, they had deported almost uh, 300,000 immigrants. And, uh, and yet again, in, in, in the middle of an election year, tw uh, thousands and thousands of immigrants throughout the country, almost 200 communities, came out once again, even though the race and deportation, to fight back to say, look, we need, we need to solve this problem. We need to have legal status so we can con continue to uh, contribute to the economy of this country. In terms of the indentor, indentor servitude, mm -hmm. that's uh, the guest worker program that are in place today are indentor servitude. I mean, uh, the corporations bring these workers into the country. They put them to work on the slave-like conditions with very little pay, days of more than 16 hours a day. And, and that had, that need to be stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to add um, on, on those things. Um, I wanted to go back about the immigrant um, that Roberto said. Um, I think what people really need to realize is that um, the immigrant who comes to this country are the one who most doing uh, the job because um, a lot of them who come, like what Roberto said, comes in 
and then they are very smart people who makes the companies grow, who makes the companies uh, work, because a lot of them learn technical things or software things or whatever the thing is, that um, because the people, outside people, comes with a dream. And then when they come to a dream, they really do a lot of productive here. And that's what a lot of people don't realize about that. Because this, because uh, a lot of the citizen here is, um, I, I don't know, but I mean, because they never, maybe because they never came in far away, uh, because they are not the one who came in far away, they do not know what it is to be suffer. Mm -hmm. And then when you really wanted to go for something, you really do it. But you do it for yourself and for the country. So. What are some of the demands and needs and rights right now that we should be focusing on with the um, migrant population and just the immigrant, you know, undocumented population in general? Yes, uh, mainly in stop the race and deportation, legalization for all, for, for all, all immigrants, uh, whether they come from Europe, Africa, or Latin America. We need uh, for these workers to have a legal status in this country. Mm -hmm. um, I think... Um, Definitely, they have to um, realize that by um, putting the fence on the border between Mexico and U.S., it really affects me. Because why they only care about that border? I mean, that's where the most thing that you hear more every time or something like that. Uh, what about the other borders? I mean, I, I'm not saying that, um, I, I, I don't know, but what I'm saying is that it's like pointing out to Mexico. And it's not only Mexican immigrant. You know, there's a lot of us. But the point is that they will not be able to stop uh, immigrant in that way, mm -hmm. or migrants, or illegals, whatever that they want to call it. That's not the best way to stop it. The best way to stop it is, I think, providing what the people needs are. Mm -hmm. It's it's mil We just went and spent a couple months in Mexico, and on our way down, we drove, and that wall, the whole militarization of the border. It's very scary. I mean, it's just it very violent and aggressive, and they're cutting into border towns on the U.S. side, over through campuses where they want that wall to go, and it's brutal. I mean, it affects everybody, and it's not just Mexicans. It's everyone coming up from Latin America and. Um, uh, Mexico and the U.S. It's just, it's no way to live. Do you think we could ever have a border-free uh, world? Is that, a, is that a dream I live in my... Um, the, quickly, because we only have a minute left. Yes. Um, what I wanted to say is that um, how come that the productions uh, or whatever, that they can flow freely? How come that the people have such a struggle? Thing? How come the U.S. can uh, export a product over there? Well, why can, I, can us have a little bit of rights? Well, the, this country was uh, the first promoter against the wall uh, that separated the both, both Germany the, after World War II, and now we're building walls to uh, try to stop a friendly, a friendly country from coming in. You know, and they have militarized these borders so incredible. They even have drones, unmanned drones. These drones have, uh, have uh, proven to be very deadly against civilians in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Well, we're running out of time. We always run out of time, and this has been such an incredible topic. We have so much we could spend a long time on it. I need to say, uh, from the father, the grandfather of public access, all media should end with a hug and a handshake. So let me give you guys a handshake. I'd hug you if I could, but I'm afraid my Thank mic you. is going to pull out here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you See for you next time. Us. Bye. Thank you.